Libros Schmibros is a podcast exploring the people, books, movies, and ideas that Angelinos care about in a thoughtful way that even New Yorkers can understand. We're coming to you from Libros Schmibros, our nonprofit bilingual lending library in Boyle Heights, on the west coast of the country and the east bank of the mighty Los Angeles River. Right. There we go. Um, uh, Mr. Robinson, we just had a, such a delightful pre-conversation that I'm, I'm uh, tempted to, uh, to retread it for just a moment, if you'll bear with me. Sure. Uh, you, uh, you, you are coming to us on a rainy day um, at, in Southern California, and even worse of a day up near you in Davis, I gather. Um, and your new book, The Ministry for the Future, uh, has uh, rather alarming predictions or at least warnings to make about what rain and other things have in store for us here. And when I say here, I, I mean not just Boyle Heights, where Libro Schmibros has its nonprofit storefront lending library, but, uh, but California and, of course, beyond. Um, we're going to have a conversation today not just about the weather, um, but about your work and also the work of a poet, a Cal another California writer whom we both love, uh, Kenneth Rexroth, uh, in part about his work for the Federal Writers Project. Um, but I would be remiss if we didn't talk for a moment about that new book of yours, which, uh, among many other glowing reviews, uh, can number uh, President Obama among its fans. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations on his having recommended it, and of course, indirectly or directly, the related phenomenon of its high ranking on the bestseller list. Um, may I ask how, beyond the Obama recommendation, um, you hope that it may begin to shape the debate around climate? Sure. Um, and thank you for that. The Ministry for the Future, my latest novel, uh, came out in last October. It was finished before the pandemic struck us, and so there's just a couple of incidental mentions that I stuck in during the copy editing phase, but it's really about coping with climate change in the next 30 years. The nice thing to see is that there are many people and organizations on this planet right now who already consider themselves to be working in or for some kind of ministry for the future. And their story hasn't really been told, at least not in science fiction, but there aren't very many stories being told of things going as well as one can imagine in the next 30 years. There's a kind of an apocalyptic vibe in the popular culture. So this novel has um, filled a need, filled a desire that people have for a story that gives hope and tells a plausible uh, narrative that you can believe in that things, although an unholy mess for the next 30 years, nevertheless, at the end of those 30 years, turn out with us having dodged the mass extinction event, to put it flatly. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just that this book touched a nerve, but that it filled the desire. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting that feedback, sometimes indirectly, sometimes directly. And uh, people who wrote the Paris Agreement are pleased, people who are doing um, charitable foundation work to try to uh, get regulations changed faster and to divest out of fossil fuels, et cetera. All kinds of groups are pleased by this book as a kind, as an imaginative um, um, description of what might happen if we did things right. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing that. Uh, I, I've been invited and I think I'm going to go to the Glasgow uh, Congress of the Parties, the COP26 meeting in Glasgow of the Paris Agreement signatories, which now wonderfully include the United States. Um, and uh, there I, I, it'll be one of the more exciting moments of my life as a, as a writer to be, um, uh, what would you call it the court jester or the mm -hmm. the science the science fiction writer of that community who's telling that particular science fiction story so yeah things are going great on that front <laughs> i'm i'm so glad um it's nice to think about uh at least uh, an optimistic future that we can work toward uh and i think especially um as a resident of the region that gets uh inundated <laughs> uh and basically drowned in in your novel um as a former yeah. Southern californian uh why have you inflicted this torrent uh on us in i think it's chapter 59 of, of uh, the ministry for the future 
Yeah, uh, th um, it was a great pleasure to write that chapter in a perverse <laughs> kind of a way. Um, I, uh, I was brought up in Orange County, right near Orange itself. Uh, and I went to school at UC San Diego for uh, most of 10 years. Uh, and, and I love both places. And we always went up to LA as being the big city that Orange County is kind of the underbelly of or the suburb to the south. Um, and the thing is that the whole basin, beautiful Mediterranean basin, one of the greatest, most blessed spots on earth in natural features and, and climate, uh, is backed by that big ring of mountains such that if an atmospheric river hits hard, um, the coastal plains are gonna get flooded. And the um, example of what can happen comes from the winter of 1861-62, um, I think, or the year after that, when uh, uh, an atmospheric river hit uh, central California and flooded the central valley of California for, for uh, something like 300 miles north to south and 40 miles east to west, a lake lasted all winter long that was up to 15 feet deep and everything human in that lake died or was melted. And of course, 1861 has a more primitive infrastructure, but also a little more resilient in that people just moved away and then came back in and rebuilt from scratch. And there wasn't that much to rebuild, to tell you the truth. Now, if it happens to LA, San Diego, Orange County, which it can, because that's climate change and that's what atmospheric rivers do. And in fact, three blocks of Encinitas fell into the ocean on one night in, 18, in the 1880s. So I, I wanted to show that in a chapter that showed that A, um, human beings will band together in physical emergencies like that and do what they can to save each other uh, and, and concentrate on human life and pets and animals. And B, that if the infrastructure of the LA basin was wiped out and you had to rebuild it more or less from scratch, you would do a better job than we did in the post-war period, that post-World War II, the 20 years after World War II, the, most of the LA Basin's infrastructure was built out of plywood and out of uh, greed. And it's not a good infrastructure. It's not a human space. I mean, when you compare it to, I don't know, uh, the actual Mediterranean, you compare it to a town like Barcelona or something, you realize that um, it's too bad, but it was done poorly. And the reconstruction of the LA Basin to a human scale and to fully support um, sustainability and human flourishing, that's like a 500 year project. And probably it's better that we do it slowly over 500 years, but if a disaster strikes, um, it, it, it's not gonna be a surprise. Mm -hmm. and, and then you've got an opportunity to rebuild in a smarter way. Well, uh, you absolutely have to visit us at Libro Schmibros, which uh, is in a beautiful old hotel built well before the post-war boom in 1889. So Beautiful. Oh, God. Yeah, I want to see it. Um, you're such a terrific novelist of ideas. Does it ever piss you off that people seem justifiably so interested in and, and willing to act on the ideas that they undervalue you as a writer? Um, no, I, I have um, made my own bed, and so I uh, need to lie in it without um, um, whining and complaining. <laughs> um, uh, the focus of my novels is unusual, and I'm a science fiction writer, and I'm um, um, formally adventurous. I'm an English major with a PhD in English and American literature, and I feel that I'm well-read in English and American literature, and I love it dearly. It's my religion. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I've made this choice. My novels are um, strange, let's say, in several different ways, form and content. So um, I think that there's a pretty good awareness of what I'm doing as a novelist, as an American novelist. And then there's also a fairly frequent focus on the ideas that I'm writing about rather than the, um, uh, the literary aspects, which is fine by me because I have foregrounded them. I mean, I, I did that on purpose. So you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. That's, that's the preschool mantra that I was taught by my, my boys preschool. Hmm. And I think it's valid. Uh, and really it would be stupid to complain because uh, my books are getting a lot of attention and from a broader community than just the science fiction community. And if there are residual, you know, high modernist uh, or 
you know, if there are residual snobbish communities that don't want to consider a science fiction writer or consider a science fiction writer to only be a tinkerer in ideas, then that's really their problem. That's not my problem. Do we, uh, do we know how Kenneth Rexroth felt about science fiction? It seemed sometimes as if he'd read everything under the sun. <laughs> he had. He definitely had. Um, I don't think it was on his radar from my own reading of his great criticism. What a amazing literary mind. Um, it did seem like he had read everything. And not only that, but his judgment about it was excellent. He could describe it to the common reader. He could describe it in technical terms. Uh, but mostly he was a, a writer intent to make sure that the American public knew the Greek classics, the Latin classics, the, the mystic tradition, the uh, Asian tradition. Uh, there's so many ways in which he, uh, the, our idea of California culture as being one of the beautiful multicultural cultures on this earth. Well, Rex Roth was instrumental in forming that California culture. His interests and what you think of as California culture are so congruent that when you think of California before Rex Roth, and then you think of California after Rex Roth, well, he was transformative. He was he was like the professor to all of us, the, the English professor that, that taught all of us. When did you first encounter his work? I was an undergraduate at UC San Diego. I was a hippie. <laughs> um, and I, I considered myself to be a poet. Um, and all this is pretty common. And I love poetry with all my heart. And I was reading um, Gary Snyder, mm. and at, and at, who I had seen read at UC San Diego. That was transformative. And I, I'd followed uh, Gary's work my whole uh, life. And now I know Gary. It's a great uh, uh, privilege and a beautiful thing in my life to know Gary Snyder. Well, somewhere in his books, he talked about Rex Roth that he had it was as a precursor figure. And there is a very beautiful book from New Directions, the collected shorter poems of Kenneth Rex Roth that has a photograph of him and his two young daughters at age like say uh, seven and 11, sta standing behind him as he sits in an armchair. That mm -hmm. book is truly one of the greatest books of poetry in American literary history. Um, and um, it, now maybe it's been superseded by the complete poetry of Kenneth Rex Roth. But I, I, if you stick to the shorter poetry, you kind of get him at his lyrical best. Mm -hmm. And there, all of his truly greatest poems are in the collected shorter. So I read that, it blew my mind. So at that point, maybe I was, I don't know, 23, 24 years old. And ever since I've been reading his work and enjoying it. And of course he was a, 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 a politically engaged writer as well. Um, you know, I've, I've assigned my students, sadly, you know, our course covers the, the whole breadth of the Federal Writers Project, at least sadly in this respect. And so all we've had time for is some of the WPA writing or, or what we hope to be the WPA writing, even though it's unsigned, but also um, Requiem for the Spanish Dead. Uh, which is yeah. the poem yeah. that blew my mind uh, when I first came to Rex Roth and maybe yours too. Yeah, beautiful work. And for Eli Jacobson, that's another beautiful political poem. Um, he's got many beautiful um, leftist political poems. It's, that was a, uh, one of the foundational uh, stances of his life was to be a proudly progressive um, radical leftist. He was a union organizer. He worked for the WPA. He was a conscientious objector during World War II and worked as a, as a nurse in a psychiatric ward mm. uh, and got hammered on a few times doing that work. Uh, and then he supported all the younger conscientious objectors who had been sent up to working jails in Oregon when they were released at the end of the war. They came down to the Bay Area because they knew Rex Roth was there. And he was like grandpa to the beats and, well, father to the beats and grandpa to the hippies. Um, but but um, always um, uh, giving them a, a really intelligent working um, leftist uh, worldview to guide their literary work and their political work. And I wanna say, uh, I edited a book of Rex Ross uh, Sierra writing, mm -hmm. which fully came to light when um, Ken Nab put an unpublished book that Rex Roth wrote for the WPA, Camping in the Western Mountains, 
Well, that never got published in its time. And then when Ken Nab put it online where you can now read it in full as a kind of typescript, I think out of the UCLA library, I'm not sure. Um, well, that book cemented my idea that Rexroth was a real Sierra person. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of the backstory of his life or his side life is the, the thing that kept him sane through a very tumultuous career in San Francisco and Santa Barbara was going to the Sierras for almost two months every summer and fall and winter. And he didn't never put it all together into one book, so I did. And so all of Rex Ross Sierra writing uh, and the relevant sections from that uh, camping guide are in one book. And I found two of the WPA sections that although, as you say, they're unsigned, I'm positive that they're Rex Ross. Uh, and I think there might be some biographical or bibliographical support for this, not just a stylistic reading, but he, he was doing his job. He, there were no Rex Rothian flourishes, mm -hmm. um, but when telling the story of Yosemite and telling the story of Sequoia in the WPA guides to the California from that time, there's a sudden paragraph of beautiful description of landscape and of the um, California Native Americans who were exiled from the lower Sierra. Uh, and I'm, I'm positive these are Rex Ross writing. And I think there might be bibliographic support for that. So I included them in my book, of, in my Sierra book um, uh, as, as mini chapters uh, so that you got a sense of him in full in fact, I'm looking at it right now. Oh yeah, from the WPA Guide to California, I have basically two pages, a description of Sequoia and General Grant National Park and a description of Yosemite National Park. So yeah. Don't put the book aside for heaven's sake. If I'm going to inflict uh, uh, the combing of your hair on you, you may as well take advantage of the camera and hold it up. Oh, sure. I, I, was, I was thinking this as a podcast, but if this is Zoom and live, you betcha. <laughs> uh, for one thing, the the um, the cover illustration is the woodblock print by the California's great artist Tom Killian, uh, who is uh, one of the great artists alive today and works in in Japanese woodblock prints, as you can see, in a style um, that he's uh, learned from Hokusai and uh, uh, the other Japanese woodblock print guy, uh, who starts with an H. Um, and uh, then there's a blurb on the back uh, from Gary Snyder. For many of us who discovered his poetry early, it's the contemplative nature in Sierra Nevada mountain poems of wide ranging observation, insight, eros, and purity that captured us. No one has written poems quite like these. Robinson has pulled together the poetry and unpublished prose of Rex Ross, amazingly many weeks and months spent in the remote high country. This book begins a new phase in the understanding of Rex Roth. He stands as tall as Robinson Jeffers in the evocation of West Coast wildness, and he sees farther ahead. So Gary gave a blurb to the book, and um, um, and Gary did know Rex Roth, and was, uh, Rex Roth was kind of an avuncular figure to Gary. My old boss, my old boss Dan, Dana Joya, told a story once about you going up and looking for, if not Rex Roth's cabin in the Sierra, or at least the clearing where you're fairly confident the cabin was. Tell me about that. Sure, with pleasure. Um, if we were more mobile, I would show you a hearthstone from um, Rex Roth's cabin that um, now sits underneath my writing chair outdoor in my front yards. But um, take it on faith that I have a beautiful uh, uh, parquet floor underneath my writing uh, chair in my front courtyard and the, the many stones from many writers' houses. Um, and Rex Ross Hearthstone uh, from probably uh, under a wood burning stove to make sure the wood burning stove didn't burn down the shack. Um, the story is this, Rex Roth found a, an abandoned sheep herder's cottage. Um, at a creek where two waterfalls would meet in a kind of a Y falls on the north side of Mount Tamalpais in an area that is now Samuel uh, P. Taylor State Park. Mm -hmm. um, David Robertson, a good friend and UC Davis professor of English had a grad student, um, Sean O'Grady, who was an expert in Rex Roth and California poetry who 
followed clues in Rex Ross writing and located in a cleft because this cabin, there were two cabins that Rex Roth used actually. One of them was cantilevered over the creek bed itself. Mm -hmm. The other one was by the creek side a little further up the trail. This is now a trail anyone can take. So we explored and we found it. We found the tin roof and we found a couple of uh, blocks of sandstone that were not like the in, the indigenous stone that was surrounding us in the, and so I figure we're hearthstone. I said to Sean O'Grady, you think it's okay? You know, cause it's like an archeological ruin. Can I take one of these uh, sandstone blocks? And he's looking at me like I was crazy going, take it. Cause <laughs> you know, in 10 years, we're not, nobody's even gonna be able to find this, what we had found because it was under the mulch and there was just a corner of tin roof sticking up in these two blocks. So that was Rex Roth um, first cabin. His second one more substantial, the state park service had just hauled away all the lumber that had been left from that second cabin of Rex Ross. And so one day we hiked up there with Dana Joya and his two sons and with um, Terry Bisson, my friend, Carter Scholes, David Robertson. And I think Sean at this point was back in New York state. I'm not sure. And we all hiked up there to the cabin with a, a bottle of whiskey and little uh, plastic cups. And we all read from Rex Roth's poems. Um, we talked about them and we were thinking about how much Rex Roth loved to stay outside of the academic context, how much he was an outlaw artist and how we had arranged this quite beautiful literary memorial event um, outside of the context of any uh, academic sponsorship or or the like. And of course, you know Dana. Dana was just thrilled that all this was happening. California poetry being celebrated outdoors uh, at the ruins of Rex Ross Cabin. This was like in the first days of 2013. So um, Dana was important in emphasizing the um, significance of the California poets that were perhaps underappreciated by American literature departments at the time. And I think he made an impact. And I think that um, Rex Roth and Jeffers in particular, along with other California poets, but those two are, are world-class poets. And I think they're coming, they will not be forgotten. They're coming back into the uh, landscape of, of literary studies. They're, they're clearly, I'm going to stick in the canon of American poetry, and they totally deserve it. My students are certainly turned on by him uh, at UCLA. Now, I was going to ask you later on um, if, if you could uh, call to mind a particular line or two of Rex Roth's um, that, that, that means something special to you. Um, you're hearing me okay, I hope. I am. Oh, good. Thought I saw some fiddling. Do you remember what you read when you went up to the, uh, to the cabin? Yeah, I kind of do. That's why I am fiddling. Um... Um, what's interesting to me, I've done this before. I try to, um, um, I try to find the, the um, uh, passages and they're usually kind of long, but um, I'll just, I, I just open the book and that's probably the best way. Um, this is from a poem from the late thirties when Rex Roth was first beginning to write about the Sierras and really changing I think maybe this is actually from the early 40s. Um, in what hour? This changed American poetry for, uh, and this is way pre Snyder. Spring, Sierra Nevada. Once more, golden Scorpio glows over the coal above Dead Man Canyon, orderly and brilliant, like an inspiration in the brain of Archimedes. I have seen its light over the warm sea, over the coconut beaches, phosphorescent and pulsing, and the living light in the water shimmering away from the swimming hand, creeping against the lips, filling the floating hair. Here, where the glaciers have been and the snow stays late, the stone is as clean as light, the light steady as stone. The relationship of stone, ice, and stars is systematic and enduring. Novelty emerges after centuries. A rock falls from the cliffs, the glacier contracts and turns grayer, the streams cut new sinuosities in the meadow. Mm. The sun moves through space and the earth with it. The stars change places. And I'm going to stop, but I want to, in this passage, I believe he mentions 
the red, um, a patch of red. Oh, above the copper mine, the cliff is blood red. The white snow breaks at the edge of it. My friend Carter Scholes pointed out to me, uh, I, I have a photo from that canyon. And when Rex Ross says the cliff is above the copper mine is blood red, we have a photo that shows that's not hyperbole, mm. that Rex Ross saw it and he noted it. And Carter was set off by that to look at Rex Ross Sierra's poems more carefully for where Rex Roth talks about the stars. And Carter is an amateur astronomer, an observer as he calls it, and so was Rex Roth. So Car and Carter has a, he's a polymath, he has a computer program that shows you where the stars were going backwards and forwards in time for hundreds of years. So he began to use Rex Ross poems to read them closely. What did Rex Ross say about the sky? And from those clues, he could actually tell you sometimes to within the week when Rex Roth had to have written the poem. And then you can get bibliographical support for that. So that's how accurate Rex Roth was in his depictions. He was not just making stuff up because it sounded good, which it does usually sound good, quite poetical. He was being precisely observant to the situation that he saw. So Carter wrote a, um, an essay that's at the back of this book, Rex Roth, The Observer, that dates to, as I say, the year and sometimes the week of about a dozen of Rex Roth Sierra poems by their star information. That's terrific. I, I, I reviewed uh, his book years ago, Radiance, and ah, it was yeah. terrific. I, 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 um, I thought of it just this morning when I heard that Livermore had uh, taken three inches of rain in an hour. Um, you, uh, now let's talk for a bit about Rex Ross' WPA work. Um, I, I'm guessing that he found the experience of writing anonymously uh, uncongenial to his vanity, as, um, as as Brendan Gill once said of the act of editing versus writing. Uh, how, how do you suppose he fit into that WPA office? Well, I would I would um, push against that. I oh. would say I would say that Rex Roth was delighted to put his shoulder to the wheel and do and make his writing also uh, part of the WPA's cause and the cause of, uh, because of his union organizing, because of his general radical leftism, that the government was actually paying writers during um, the depression to do this stuff. I think um, he loved it. And what, what, and I think support for that comes from the absolutely anonymous style, uh, what the way he took all Rex Rothian flourishes out of his WPA writing. So you couldn't tell it from anybody else's writing. I think that for him was an exercise in pastiche. Mm -hmm. Like if you're gonna write a guidebook, this is how you'd write a guidebook. It'd be really clear, really clean and really transparent. So you're not thinking about the writer. Oh, what a beautiful phrase. You're thinking about, ah, Sequoia, I gotta go see that, et cetera. So um, this is my impression. And, and one thing then in support of that, if you read, uh, Camping in the Western Mountains, his unpublished guide for campers that he wrote for the WPA. Well, that's got a lot of kind of humorous awesome. down home personal touches. Um, but um, again, it's not poetical. It's not insisting on him. He doesn't tell you what he's done up there. He tells you how to do it up there and erases himself. So um, I, and also he claims, and now, I will say that some of his biographers, and when we get off the record, maybe I'll talk to you about that, mm -hmm. have cast aspersions on his um, honesty, or I guess at his best, they would say he was a tall tale teller. Um, and okay, he was a tall tale teller. Uh, and so he made up a bunch of stuff and in, in his autobiographical novel, he's making up stuff left, right and center. And that's why they had to call it an autobiographical novel. Rex Roth would say, hell no, all that happened. And I had to call it a, a novel, an autobiographical novel because uh, my lawyers at, at New Directions said I was gonna get sued up the wazoo if I, if I called it a true autobiography. So I called it a novel so as to give myself legal protection. He said, he would say, I never make things up. Well. Now that might be another tall tale, but once you see Carter's essay about his star 
uh, references being accurate right to the hour, it gives a little more credence to the rest of the stuff that he's talking about. And so he says that he was part of the WPA project that painted the giant mural on the inside of the Coit Tower. Really? Yes. He, he went down there, he had a big buckets of paint and uh, he painted, and I guess that mural's gone. It got um, whitewashed or knocked out or if it's- they, So far as I know, maybe they whitewash or they cover up their murals of, of George Washington in San Francisco. But if anybody touches a hair on Coit Tower, I think he, there'd be hell to pay. Maybe so. Um, so um, don't, my, my memories of all this are now a full decade old. Um, and so I might be wrong on this one, but uh, I will say that uh, I remember quite clearly that, that Rex Roth made the claim that he was one of the painters of the Quaint Tower, along with his first wife, Andre, who was an artist. So, um, and now, you know, even though he's been called a tall tale teller, I've never caught him out in a tall tale where something that he said is demonstrably untrue to the record. I'm thinking, yeah, why would he make that up when he, when he clearly had an extravagant life and did a whole lot of stuff and he was proud of it? Um, I'm kind of thinking if he said he did it, he probably did. Hmm. I've often wanted to, uh, to, to follow uh, Camping in the Western Sierra as a literal guidebook up into the mountains, although I stopped short of, uh, of wanting to bring a pack mule with me. Do you know why that was never published? I don't. I think, um, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, uh, Ken Nab would be the one to ask. I, Ken I'm just going to ask about it. My student, I, I owe him a great debt of gratitude, though perhaps New Directions doesn't, because I send my students to his website, the Bureau of Public Secrets, to read Rex Roth, uh, uh, you know, whatever I assign to them. You, you, just very briefly, who is that guy? Uh, Ken Nab is a is a old hippie uh, intellectual, uh, Berkeley guy, um, and truly uh, outside the academy academic, mm -hmm. a scholar and. A, um, uh, a quite energetic and inventive uh, local teacher in an informal kind of studio way, like a salon, like Rex Roth was doing. Yeah. And, and there, Rex Roth is only one of many of Ken Nab's interests. He, he loves this, the French situationists. Yeah. He translates from French into English, uh, although mainly he relies on uh, what I think he would call more accomplished translators, but he loves the French uh, uh, situationists and the whole May 68 mo movement. But he, he runs classes on say, um, um, well, anything really, Baudelaire or Rambeau or going back to, uh, all the way back in French literature history and then American literature. And what it was was at the UC bookstore in Berkeley they had a back room where they would gather back in pre-pandemic days, and now it's kind of a Zoom thing. He has a tremendous library, and he's a, uh, he has a, a lifelong interest in Rex Roth. I think he met him. He wrote a short book about him. He discovered all this stuff in the stacks, and then he put it online for us. And so um, everybody who loves Rex Roth owes a giant debt of gratitude to Ken Nab. And he helped me hugely in getting together my Sierra book. He's not a Sierra person, but he knows that Rex Roth was. So he helped me big time in assembling my book and getting me in touch with the literary executor and so on and so forth. I wish he could dig up and post more of Rex Roth's old Pacifica Radio programs. Pacifica Radio founded by Lou Welch, a conscientious objector, who for all I know is one of the guys you were mentioning who came to San Francisco precisely because Rex Roth was there. Um, yes, yes, that's right. Him and Phil Whalen, another great poet. Uh, they were, and Brother Antonius, um, whose real name I'm forgetting, um, they all came down from Oregon uh, as young kids after the war, and they had been interned as conscientious objectors. They came because of Rex Roth, and he gave them contacts and publications. Uh, in other words, he published them and got them started in various ways. They all uh, speak very kindly of him, and so does that whole San Francisco renaissance. Sometimes they were mean to Rex Roth, and actually one story shows that maybe Rex Roth was a bit of a tall tale teller, these younger guys, Robert Duncan had a real um, impish, uh, not to say uh, nasty streak, 
Hmm. Um, and so he and maybe Jack Spicer got drunk and they and they came over to Rex Roth had an open night on Wednesday nights. Anybody could come over and chat. It was a salon. So they went over one Wednesday night and as they were uh, walking up, up to Rex Roth's place, they concocted a, a trick. And they told Rex Roth they had just seen the paintings of the famous French painter X and how great it was. And then Rex Roth began to say to them, well, yes, I met Rex, I met X back when I was in France in the 20s. And so these two younger poets were on the floor laughing their heads off because they had just made X up. <laughs> so maybe Rex Roth was a bit of a, a bullshitter. I'm not sure. That is a, a strong evidence, uh, well attested, that he was inclined to try to be the guy who knew everything to these younger poets. Well, a, gr a greater claim to that title, I think, than just about anybody I think of. I mean, yeah. as the founder of a lending library, you know, Lawrence Ferlinghetti has been a terrific inspiration to me. And now as, you know, in this context, what, what how path however pathetically I pass for a broadcaster, um, at least in podcasting, you know, the idea of him as somebody who had a weekly radio show about poetry on, you know, KPFA um, is, is equally inspiring. Do you know if any of those shows survive? Have you ever heard one? I asked about it. I've never heard one. I've heard some recordings of Rex Roth because he was recorded a lot reading his poetry with jazz accompaniments. Yeah. And, and those exist as LPs and now as cassettes and uh, I hope they're online. Who knows? Ken Nab will know more about all this stuff than I do, uh, including the uh, radio broadcast. But what I would want to say there is that not only a weekly radio broadcast that everybody was listening to because it was early TV days and radio was still predominant, but also um, an almost weekly newspaper column for the uh, San Francisco Examiner. Uh, the Hearst uh, newspaper and everybody's saying, oh, it's, you're writing for Hearst. And Rex Roth would say, I don't care because <laughs> I'm being read by everybody. And whoever publishes it, I get to say what I want. And he was very insistent on that. And about once or twice a year, his, since it was a weekly or biweekly column, um, he would write about his Sierra trips. So in my collection of his Sierra writings, there are four or five really beautiful uh, columns that were showing up in your daily paper in San Francisco in the 50s and early 60s, suddenly you'd be learning. And you're right, he did always take a burrow. He would, he would um, when backpacking became common after the war, he was a little embarrassed by this. Oh, I do it old school. Oh, I'm old style. I'm old fashioned. Just a square, he would say. But the thing is, you take a burrow and, um, you know, 500 pounds or 300 pounds of supplies, you can stay up there for five weeks straight in a way that backpackers would never do. So Rex Roth would take off with these burrows that he would rent back in the days when people knew enough about taking care of horses and burrows and mules that you could go to horse packers and they would actually just let you go off with one of their animals because back then their people knew animals. They don't do that anymore and no one would know how to deal. But uh, for Rex Roth, he even had his favorite burrows with names. He would go with them for like five or six years straight. And he said his burrow, uh, BB, was way more intelligent than many of his human associates back down in San Francisco. So, and it allowed him to spend time in the Sierras like nobody else has spent time in the Sierras. Well, I, like, like no other working intellectual literary person. I'm thinking of myself. I'm thinking of even Snyder. Uh, all the people who got into backpacking, you only can carry about a week to 10 days worth of food on your back and then you're humping a load. And so Rex Ross style, although he called it old fashioned and was a little bit embarrassed about it, was actually very high functioning. Hmm. And he saw a lot of the Sierras. We actually, I drew a map of every place he had mentioned he had been in the Sierras, which I presume is probably about maybe 20 or 30% of all the places he had really been. These are named in his poems and routes described. And so I could map where he'd been in the Sierras and it's, a, it's really comprehensive. He was a true Sierra person. I may hit you up for that map at some point or if Rex Roth ever drew one, uh, some friends at the Huntington Library are working on an exhibit of literary maps. And uh, of course, you know, this gets my mouth watering. I, I wanna get back to um, the, the idea of, uh, of him as a camper and even you as a camper uh, in just a minute before I turn you loose. But I, I didn't wanna let the opportunity pass uh, as we talked about um, his newspaper columns uh, to mention that, uh, to be very grateful in fact for um, your having included them in your anthology 
Uh, I had a book out a couple of years ago called Dear Los Angeles, The City and Diaries and Letters. And I used one of those columns in which he mentions coming down to Los Angeles and saying, you know, things not very kind about Los Angeles cuisine. In fact, he didn't have a super high opinion of Los Angeles, did he? No. And I would say this. He was a San Francisco patriot. He made he helped to make San Francisco culture. He arrived with Andre in 1927 when he was 22 years old. And at that point, in cultural terms, it was still um, back in the day of George Sterling and Helen Hunt Jackson. It was um, almost a, a Gilded Age culture in 27. And he quickly was a force to modernize San Francisco culture and make, as I said, the California culture that we now think of as normal for California, somewhat of a Rex Roth invention of his own personal interests. So um, it's in, to the enduring shame of UC Berkeley, of San Francisco State, um, that they didn't offer him a, a teaching position, an adjunct teaching position, and give him some money and some health insurance when he wanted it. And he had to look around and it was UC Santa Barbara that offered him a job. And he had to move there at the same time that his health stopped him going up to the High Sierra. So in, in one year of his life, I think it was like 1967, he both stopped going to the Sierras and he moved out of San Francisco to Santa Barbara. Well, you have a different uh, Rex Roth after that. Crabbier, <laughs> uh, a more paranoid. Gary Snyder was um, head of the California uh, on the California Arts Commission, which was founded by Governor Jerry Brown his first time around in the 70s. And Gary arranged for the first California Medal of the Arts to be given to Rex Roth. Gary, Jerry Brown was happy, uh, said, sure. And Gary called up Rex Roth on the phone, said, and this is in the 70s sometime, said, uh, we, uh, we we're going to give you the California gold medal of the arts. And Rex said, I'm never taking anything from that fascist Jerry Brown and slammed down the phone and uh, refused to accept the award. Well, um, and there are many stories of him visiting UC campuses in the seventies um, as a guest poet where he comes off poorly as a imperious and crabby and paranoid. And I would say this, that he's not the same man then, that he's suffering from health problems and from mental health problems. Yeah. And it's and it's it's the fault of the San Francisco universities, because if he had stayed in San Francisco, you would have had a happier Rex Roth in the last 15 years of his life. Yeah. So um, these, acad these English departments cannot be trusted to see the, the, the diamonds amongst them. Well, you were part of one once. What'd you learn about writing from teaching freshman comp? I learned where to put the commas. <laughs> uh, I, I um, love teaching freshman composition. And indeed, this was my Rex Rothian political choice. If English departments are an unnecessary excrescence on literature, a parasite, and a uh, freeloading, um, uh, like as if you're a Protestant and you have a relationship with God, which is literature, and then English departments are like Catholics. They say, no, you got to talk to the priest. And the priest is the intermediary between you and God. Well, Rex Roth was a Protestant, right? And um, I am a Protestant. Uh, but I also grew up in the university system. And University of California, San Diego was tremendous to me. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot. And I taught a lot. But here's the thing. I decided that English departments should first teach writing to freshmen as like a service to the world. And once they had taught freshmen how to write properly, later on, maybe you could have an English class or two that was a literature class and would it would teach you something hard like Ulysses or Dante or, I mean, there are many, many texts where a, a good guide can lead you through the forest and, you, and it's better than that Protestant getting lost in the forest sometimes as an ancillary gesture. So I taught nothing but freshman comp for 11 years of my, my, my young university career and I loved it. And I certainly do know where the commas go. And I also know the commas go where you want them to go in <laughs> order to make the right rhythm. That in other words, grammar or this uh, copy editor's notion that there were actual laws or rules that, um, that you're prescriptive rather than descriptive, that's all wrong. Ling linguists will tell you that um, 
grammar is uh, secondary to people's practice. It's an attempt to describe people's already existing practice. It's not rules that are made up by some teacher that tells you what's right and what's wrong. Language is much more alive and organic than that. So that too I taught. And I, I helped many a young student to go from being scared and, and angry. I mean, it's their native tongue, right? And they were being told they were incompetent in their native language. I, I taught a lot of remedial writing. Mm -hmm. and so people would get into the UC system, but they would fail the writing test and be told that they were crap writers. And sometimes they kind of were, but not because they weren't articulate people. So I would do this thing, they would call it telling writing or um, the idea that automatic writing, um, just sit down and write as fast as you can without even thinking about it. That paragraph will be better than and solve 90% of your problems as a writer. And then you can revise the other, the mistakes out of existence. So I think I did a lot of good as a teacher and I quite enjoyed it. And I would have enjoyed doing it my whole working career, but um, I was bringing up kids. I was writing science fiction novels. Uh, my wife is a federal scientist and had a, a good salary and health insurance. So I quit teaching when when our first son was born and I never taught again, yeah. except as a guest lecturer. Um, well, I bet you've, you've, whether you know it or not, you probably got a lot of dis, uh, distinguished alumni, students who got their first taste of writing and went off to wonderful things. Um, I'm curious, uh, were there particular models that you assigned, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, writers whom you had your students read because you thought they could, you know, it, it would make better writers out of them? Well, yes, and thank you for that, because it was actually a matter of huge contention amongst the graduate students and young um, right, visiting lecturers that I was teaching with. These were my colleagues, and we had meetings where we argued fiercely over the pedagogy of teaching writing, because it's an open question how to do it. And you can't just teach form. Uh, writing is a matter of content as well as form. So we would talk about critical thinking. So I would give them Orwell, Orwell's uh, Shooting an Elephant, the essays of Orwell. And I would say, look, this guy's love was clarity and clarity is a virtue. I, I believed in that very strongly, even though I love the, the uh, variously obscure modernist masters so that you can't help but love Faulkner and Virginia Woolf and the various modern masters that kind of broke the language up in order to blow your mind and make you think in literary terms. But if you're writing essays, if you're trying to communicate with other people on and not worried about the art of novel writing or of stream of consciousness, but rather with communication, and clarity is a huge virtue. And I would teach Orwell. This was funny because in the uh, debates with the other um, writing instructors, Orwell was seen as a kind of an anti-communist, a, a leftist who lost his nerve and didn't support Stalin when he should have. And this is, a see, I have to tell you, this is the 1970s. And there were other fellow instructors who were giving their students Marcuse in order to show that <laughs> writing is as hard as chemistry and show them that they were into a serious intellectual exercise here, not just trying to learn their ABCs. And I would, I mean, Marcuse, um, he is an interesting theorist, but he's writing- He's also on campus, right? At UCSD. He was there on campus, yes, but also he is incomprehensible to your freshmen because his German philosophy assumes you know things you don't know. And also his style is translated out of German very poorly and weirdly. In other words, as an example for writing, mm -hmm. I would argue that Marcuse was nearly useless and even an impediment to getting your, a grip on one's own writing as a freshman. So I argued for Orwell, other people argued for Marcuse. We, it's not like we, came to fisticuffs but we certainly <laughs> we certainly were yelling we were yelling at each other about theories of pedagogy <laughs> well those those arguments continue i'm here to tell you uh there's for my money uh, a whole lot of theory taught at ucla that that maybe uh, is is a little premature at least um in the younger grades and yet i teach a class um uh, from time to time called um uh, the 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 window pane and the kaleidoscope better writing with George Orwell and Thomas Pinchon. Uh, oh, good, <laughs> bless you. Well, that's and what a great uh, title. Um, the window pane and the kaleidoscope is captures precisely these different visions of what writing can be. 
and and I want to say immediately that all styles are good if they work for what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, uh, there's not one style fits all circumstances. The, otherwise, literature would be boring. In fact, there's many styles, and the kaleidoscope is uh, can be a beautiful experience, very beautiful. So the window pane, and of course, uh, as people will often argue, there's no such thing as a window pane. Language is language. You've got to do work of interpretation, even on the simplest prose. You know, I went down to the store. You have to start thinking from that very moment about things that are more complex than a, than just looking through a window pane. I but can't. it's a but it's a great metaphor. I can't, I mean, it's, I didn't, it's not mine. It's Orwell's own. He said, you know, I think in politics in the English language that writing should or could aspire to the clarity of a, a window pane. Um, I can't wait to share this podcast with my students. Um, now, just one or two, and then I promise I'll let you go. Um, now, you, of course, live near a UC campus. You live near Davis. I'm curious, is that, is that at least partly because of its, because it puts you even closer to the Sierra than Rex Roth was in San Francisco? No, it's because of my wife's work. No. Um, I, since I can write anywhere, um, we had met in Davis by a, a lucky coincidence, uh, got married, left Davis, lived in Switzerland, and then in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to get back to California, and that's for my friends and for the Sierra and for my family, um, but the Sierra was big. I was flying from Washington, D.C. to go for one week in the Sierra for a few years there, and I wanted more. So when when Lisa looked for a new job, the by a complete coincidence, really, although maybe not totally a coincidence, but in any case, she found a job for the U.S. Geological Survey, but based in their Sacramento office. And Sacramento is very much like Orange County. And as much as I loved growing up in Orange County, I didn't want to live in anything that resembled your ordinary California suburbia. And Davis is more like a small town. It's surrounded by fields and there's a, um, a bypass that floods every winter um, between Davis and Sacramento. So there's no possibility of Davis melding into Sa Sacramento in the usual California real estate style. So it is a little college town and exceptionally boring, I must say. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that sense, all of Southern California is vastly more interesting as a place to live than Davis is. But, you know, there's nothing to do but write. And this explains a whole lot about me. I, I've written a lot because I got nothing else to do here until I head for the Sierras or until I go down to the Bay Area. My literary life has been in the Bay Area. Very beautiful. Very Rex Rothian. Um, to go into one of these scuzzy little uh, rooms above a bar, reading in the dark um, to uh, 20 young San Franciscans who are loving the idea, the Kerouac idea, the six gallery reading that is described in um, Kerouac's uh, Dharma Bums. That's still, until the pandemic, that was happening every night in San Francisco. And I love those young people who were treating literature the way Rex Roth would have wanted it. It was very much of a Rex Roth vibe. Hmm. So uh, I, I consider myself to be living in the provinces of San Francisco when I'm in Davis, because Davis is so boring. <laughs> Or the or the foot or the the lower foothills of the Sierra to think of it in different terms. So you do get back up in the mountains with some frequency, all the time, as much as I can, given that I'm a, a suburban house husband and have responsibilities. I think it adds up to about a, a month of every year, wow. um, and that takes some work. But I've gone up there. I, I kind of keep records, and I can't be positive about this, but I've gone up about 150, 150 backpacking trips now in since uh, 73 um and so any, i i love it do you do any writing up there like rex roth did um not like him because the cool thing about him with his burrows and with his solitude and maybe his daughters or a couple of friends um but but when you live up there and finally get time to write poems that's what he did and he and he knew like in his his camping guidebook from the 30s, he knew which woods burned which way because he had a campfire every night. Now, we don't do that anymore in the Sierras. In ecological terms, I haven't had a fire in the high Sierra for 35 years. 
Um, so I don't know anything about what words burn which way. So I included that page in my book of Rex Ross Sierra writing because I don't believe there's any human that could tell us what he tells us about the burning qualities of wood for both light and longevity and warmth. And he was clearly going off on how much he knew and wanted you to know it. Um, so I usually take up a tiny, what, well, what I do now is uh, because I'm an ultralight backpacker and try to take the least amount of weight possible. I take no books and I take, uh, I write on the back of my maps. So mm -hmm. my, I, I definitely have a topographical map. So then I bring a ballpoint pen or two. And at the end of every day, I will write um, um, what I did that day in brief. And then maybe a kind of a Buddhist daily, we call them. You know how in the um, Qing dynasty, uh, widows, who would have outlived their husbands and yet they were middle class, they were literate, they would become Buddhist nuns and they would write a daily meditation that was a poem. Thousands of these have been saved. Rexroth himself translated quite a few, uh, but there were anthologies of them. And here's what I would recommend to your students is that you get in the habit of thinking of poetry as not something high and mighty and impossible, but uh, as a way to um, shape your thoughts into something pretty that can be just even um, as short as a haiku or as long as a sonnet, but without any formal constrictions, just line it out, try to make it a little surprising, try to make it poetical and however you want to think of that, but certainly Chinese landscape poetry, which Rex Roth loved, is a great way to de-emphasize form and stick with uh, content that one ought to do that and, and, and be open to it being an almost daily experience, like a meditation or a prayer. Well, I should uh, mention that I'm working on the sequel to Dear Los Angeles now, uh, Dear California, the city in diaries and the state in diaries and letters. So uh, I, may, I may hit you up for directions to some of Rex Ross diaries and, and even uh, you know, uh, uh, go down on bended knee and see if you can spare one or two um, for, for posterity. Um, I, let me just, uh, let, first let me, uh, before we wrap up, I want to turn over all the, all the cards as they used to say on what's my line and let you know that the reason that I've organized a course around the WPA writers is that I'm working very hard um, to uh, revive uh, the WPA and I've got um, Congressman Ted Lieu about to introduce a bill in Congress uh, to do just that. So um, I- Yeah, I, cool. <laughs> It's a great plan, and I, I hope it succeeds, and good for you for pushing it. Um, because now we're talking about the Green New Deal, and we've got climate change, and we've got uh, Biden seems to be thinking of himself in modeling himself on FDR in good ways. And the Green New Deal is a, is a, a real plan, but I want to say it shouldn't be reified. Um, the, the New Deal under FDR was five distinct moments mm. of push that lasted for right to the end of World War II. And the GI Bill and the UN have to be thought of as uh, FDR's, it was his own idea, the GI Bill. And Eleanor Roosevelt was a big push for the UN idea. This was the last step of the New Deal and in, in the States. And um, uh, each one of those steps was crucial. And the WPA and the, the writers program, uh, the federal writing project were say, if I recall right, 35, 36, 37, they weren't in the first New Deal, they were in the second one when we still needed big stimulus help. So um, this is 2021 is a, gonna be a depression or at least a giant recession. And we're in that New Deal mode of, all hands on deck, everything needs to be done. So it's a perfect moment for it. And it fits historically and it fits to the present. And, and the arts, especially theater and movies, uh, these arts that require, and music, uh, congregations of people for their audiences, they're being hammered. So um, the writing needs to be done and then the productions can come later. So it's a fabulous idea and I'm right. glad you're doing it. I, I'm hoping that it would also help reintroduce the country to itself at a time when there's such yeah. a vision. Um, one yeah. last thing, I guess, 
Um, I don't know if you know, the, the Getty uh, down here does a thing every few years called Pacific Standard Time, um, where they seed exhibitions and artistic undertakings around a, a single theme. Um, you know, they did post-war art a few years ago. They did uh, Los Angeles itself as an inspiration. And the theme around which they've just introduced, they've just announced grants is the intersection of art and science and Los Angeles. Um, now, why do you say, wow? <laughs> that's a good, well, that's like a Venn diagram where there's three circles. So you intersect all three. Um, um, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. The uh, science fiction history is indeed um, got a Southern California, LA nexus. The Los Angeles Science Fiction Organization uh, has been active since the 30s, and it includes luminaries, uh, Robert Heinlein, Crazy Bob, as they called him then <laughs> in LA, um, um, L. Ron Hubbard, um, uh, Heinlein's house in North Hollywood, where he rented, I guess, that house. People know where it is. They go to it. Uh, but And also Bradbury. And Bradbury's with, crucial. With whom you share a birthplace. Am I wrong? Yeah, no. Uh, Bradbury was born in Waukegan, Illinois, and so was I. Um, and then we both grew up in Southern California when our parents moved us out there. Bradbury, when he was about 10, my parents when I was about three, He's about, he's just a little bit younger than my parents. So one generation before. Uh, and I love Bradbury and it was so cool. Dana Joya and the NEA honoring Bradbury. That was one of the few times I met Bradbury, although the Planetary Society held a birthday party for him that were very memorable for me to party on uh, Bradbury's maybe 80th or 83rd birthday with Lieutenant O'Hara and other luminaries of the LA scene. So art, science, Los Angeles, well, I think of science fiction as being my angle on that, but there will be other angles. The, the stupendous uh, artworks that require a scientific um, uh, element to them, like that gigantic rock that they brought into LA and dropped at the Getty or somewhere nearby. Um, I, I was at an event with the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, LOCA or LACA, LACO, LOCA, um, <laughs> LOCO, yes, no. where, well, it was LOCO that night because Marina Abramovich um, was their, um, was their artist for the evening and um, she arranged one of her spectacular um, art, performance art installations that I got to uh, witness and uh, and have dinner with her that night. And we that stimulated further collaborations between her and me that had a science art aspect to it, but it was more San Diego because we did it at UCSD. But her night in Los Angeles was hilarious and transgressive and fantastic in the way that she usually is. So um, there are things you can do down there. I'll say, um, I'm, my mind is still reeling with the possibilities. Um, I, uh, um, I, I, one last uh, question for you. Um, did you say that you might be, uh, you might not be done with Rex Roth uh, as uh, an inspiration for, for a project of your own? Uh, yes, that's right. I am writing a book about the Sierra Nevada. It's nonfiction. It's a combination of geology, history, and memoir. And I'm surprising myself. I don't believe in memoir, but when I'm writing about the Sierra, my own experiences there rise to the page and demand to be written. So I'm doing um, a kind of a autobiography of, of the artist as young and stupid mountaineer. Yeah. Uh, I'm having fun with it. And But in my history chapters about Sierra people, I'm talking about people like uh, Muir and Norman Clyde and then also Rex Roth and Snyder and Mary Austin mm. uh, and the the women of the Sierra Club who were um, not well remembered but were fantastic in their time like Marion uh, Parsons, Marion Randall Parsons who was John Muir's secretary uh, when she became widowed she kind of married the Sierra Club that she was already in because she had been married to a Sierra Club director uh, Ed Parsons. Well, Marion Parsons Randall wrote novels, uh, and this is a kind of a Dana Joya or Ken Nab project to um, 
uh, pull back into, if not into the canon, then at least into the readership, these California writers who were uh, forgotten partly because they were women, partly because they were writing about mountains, and partly because most writers get forgotten no matter what. So um, I am involved in that project. And as part of that, since, if, since I showed the other book, I'm gonna show you this one too, because it has another great Tom Killian cover. Ooh, yeah. Um, um, so this is Mount Thoreau, but we named it Mount Thoreau. Uh, obviously informally, formal names are a hideous process in wilderness areas, you can't really do it. Um, but there's a Mount Emerson in the Sierra Nevada already formally named, perhaps by Muir, although it seems he named a different mountain that, but in any case, there's a Mount Emerson across from it, up a canyon that people have to hike up to get into the Sierras on the east side, Paiute Pass, an old Native American trail. There's an unnamed mountain across from Mount Emerson that is a little shorter, a lot gnarlier, and very charismatic. And that's this mountain. And so we made an expedition, and I know Rex Roth would have loved it, Gary Snyder was indeed part of it as our patron saint, and he was down at base camp because at that point he was in his mid 80s. Uh, and the name is sticking. If you go to caltopo.com, this is the best topographical map of California because it's been made up by search and rescue people who need a good map when they're doing search and rescue. And if you go to it, you can actually see that they've named, they've got all the informal names because informal names, formal names, they don't care. They need to find people. So Mount Thoreau is now on that map and it's on Google Maps. And so we seem to, and we do have this book uh, celebrating it. So this is a kind of a Rex Roth project post Rex Roth. And a lot of the people who did the Rex Roth Memorial were part of this group also. So um, this is another cool thing we have going on that I think of as being um, California and then art and then science because of the way that Thoreau was a citizen science and the way transcendentalism was a kind of a, uh, a scientification of uh, Protestant religion or vice versa. Um, it's close enough to fit your purview. Well, it's great to think of, of Thoreau and Emerson together again, and maybe with, with Rex Roth and you as a kind of uh, uh, environmental Mount Rushmore. Um, well, that would, that would be a little too much for me. I like it. And I do think Rex Roth is highly deserving of a name in the Sierra compared to many of the names up there, because some of them have to be taken down. But yeah. luckily, there is Rex Roth Alley in San Francisco around the corner from City Lights Books and from where he lived. And so um, even though he deserves a Sierra name also for some little feature or other, um, I had, that hadn't actually occurred to me to think about what he would like and what might be appropriate. But um, I am in my book on a campaign to remove the Confederate and racist names, scientific racist names that are in the High Sierra, but at the same time, and on a campaign to defend John Muir from similar recent attacks, some of which come out of UCLA, mm -hmm. some of which come out of friends of mine at UCLA. But I think having now read all of John Muir to be sure there isn't some kind of smoking gun there, I think that this is wrong, that John Muir was actually an admirable character even on these issues that he's being criticized on and that he's worth defending, whereas other uh, famous names from his same era, including founders of the Sierra Club that weren't him, um, deserve to have to not be honored anymore. We don't want to cancel them from history. That's impossible. But we don't have to honor them either. So this is an interesting game. Uh, and I think names are a kind of game, but it's also an important game that, that I've gotten into as well. Well, when you come back down here, maybe we can, uh, uh, you'll put in an appearance at Libro Bros, and then we can go up and rename Mount Baden Powell um, <laughs> as Mount Thoreau, uh, no, sorry, as Mount Rex Roth. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure he would have mixed feelings about a peak named after him in Southern California, but. Uh, yeah, no, we, I believe we need to have a Sierra feature. Um, and there are many, uh, there's probably at least five names in the Sierras that need to be removed and replaced. Another elderly uh, white guy is probably uh, low on the list 
uh, people of color and women were neglected in the first wave of Sierra naming in a way that can be uh, rectified. Mm -hmm. um, but a little uh, Rexroth Pass, um, 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 you know, it's a great idea. Something ought to be, he ought to be remembered up there too. Because if you think about Sierra writers, and I have, I've got a, a bibliography um, th that is pretty complete. Uh, because it's a fairly small body of literature, to tell you the truth. He's one of the top handful of people who have written about the Sierra Nevadas as a space of joy and beauty and and significance. Well, so, yeah. yeah. You'll have to share that bibliography uh, with me when I, if I ever teach another syllabus not about the WPA again. Um, anyway, uh, I promised my, my Libra Shmibros colleague, Quatemoc, after the hour-long Mike Davis interview, that I would never do an interview that long again, but- Okay, I, I, let's I, stop. No, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm apologizing you for keeping you so long, but it's been uh, irresistible and a privilege. And like I say, I can't wait to share it with my students, with, uh, with Libros and uh, with, with anybody who, who um, might enjoy it as much as I have. Thank you, Stan. Thank, thank you, David. And thank you again for uh, Guadalajara and LA in the Spanish language world, um, which is how we first met and for everything. Well, I, uh, I, I look forward to continuing the friendship and um, it, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you again. You betcha. And leave takings are always really abrupt on uh, Zoom, so, but we're used to it now. So um, we'll talk by email. I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay, you bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So ends another episode of Libro Schmibros, recorded at the bilingual nonprofit Libro Schmibros Lending Library in Boyle Heights. By all means, follow us online in all the old familiar places or email us via info at libroschmibros.org. By the way, we couldn't do this podcast without the whole Libros team, Quatemoc, Colleen, Diana, and Alberto. And all of them would kill me if I didn't add this. Please consider visiting libroschmibros.org hitting the donut button, <laughs> the donate button, and giving us a gift. We put good free books into people's hands five days a week here at Libros, right across from Mariachi Plaza, up in the old Boyle Hotel. I'm David Kippen, and there'll always be a free book for you, and thousands more to borrow here at Libros Schmibros. <laughs>